Hey folks, this is Sebastian with a follow-up video for our home lab challenge, uh, actually the first home lab challenge with the bouncing ball. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, check out the video in which I uh, challenged you. Um, so this is a short follow-up where I explain some of the background stuff. There will be some math in here. Um, don't worry, I, I will try to uh, explain it without the math, but we will need uh, one or two formulas. And um, where I also present some of the videos sent in from our users. Okay, so first I want to explain how this experiment works or um, more precisely how VFOX can figure out the height of a bouncing ball. So the experiment worked like this. Uh, we had um, a little steel ball or some other ball that we drop. It bounces a few times and VFOX tells you from which height you drop, drop the ball. Um, so what's happening there, um, if we try to um, draw it, so let me introduce a time axis on the x-axis, uh, on the horizontal axis, and the height from which we drop the ball, or the height of the ball uh, on the vertical axis. So at some point we drop the ball from the height zero. So let's say over here we have our ball and we just drop it and over time it falls down, bounces, reaches a lower height, bounces again, bounces again, and oh, this the last one wasn't good to draw because an important detail about this, so let me uh, fix this a little uh, quickly. The important detail about this is that the bouncing um, period will get ever shorter. So a typical sound everybody knows of a dropping ball is bum, 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 bum. Okay, so it gets quicker. And VFOX uses the principle it also uses for its uh, acoustic stopwatch to determine the time interval between each bounce. So what we get from VFOX right away, and it also shows this in the user interface, is uh, this time interval. I will call it T1, or to be, uh, to be good uh, physicists, we call it delta T1. So delta is just for time difference, okay, or for difference of a uh, value. Um, we get a difference, time difference two. And of course, we get a time difference three, and so on and so on. Now, the first question is, uh, what can we tell from this time difference? Um, from this time difference, we cannot directly say anything about the initial height. Um, but what we can say from this time difference is the maximum height that we reach uh, in one of these intervals. So let's call this H1 for height one, uh, H2, oops and h3 and of course 4 and so on. Um, we have to assume something here. We have to assume that we are dealing with a free fall. Free fall means uh, we are neglecting air friction which is valid for a massive ball. It wouldn't be true for a balloon. I mean, you all know a balloon drops slower <laughs> than a steel ball. Um, not because uh, it uh, sees a different acceleration from Earth, uh, but because of air drag. Okay, so in a vacuum, the, ball would uh, the, the balloon would actually fall as, uh, as fast as uh, the steel ball. Um, but since we're on Earth and we have got air here, um, it's only an assumption to deal with the free fall. So it depends on your choice of ball and the velocities you're dealing with. But if we can assume that it's a free fall, and I think it's quite valid for the steel ball I used, um, we can apply our simple formula for acceleration. Don't get afraid, I write it down once, um, but I will explain this also. So the distance traveled by any object that's uh, constantly accelerated is uh, half of the acceleration times uh, at the time squared plus initial velocity times the time plus the initial distance it has. Um, we take, make it a little bit easier here. Uh, we say our time reference is at this maximum point. So when a ball reaches its maximum, um, it will have a point where it has zero velocity before it drops down again. Um, and we say this is our T0, this is our start point, that's our reference um, um, distance as well. So we can say these are zero and we only have to deal with one half A times T squared. And then it's very simple because the acceleration is a well-known one. Um, the acceleration here is Earth's acceleration, which is um, pretty much 9.81 meter per square second. There are small local variations to this, but uh, 9.81 is a very good approximation for pretty much every place on Earth. Um, and uh, our T 
is um, actually half of the time interval that we have. So from here to there, let's use a color. So this time interval here is delta T1 half. So we can use this formula to get our H1. So the, this uh, height difference actually, if we want to be very precise about this, so this would be our H1, uh, is half Earth's acceleration times delta T1 over two squared. So with this formula, um, so you can punch this into a calculator, but VFOX does this to you, we can calculate the maximum height we've got between, uh, over our time interval um, for any of these time intervals. So with this, we already got H1, H2, H3, H4, and so on, depending on how many bounces you counted. Now the difficult part, or mathematically that's even easier, but uh, the, the tricky part to, to uh, get the idea how to get there is how can we get H0. Um, because, because we do not have a time interval for this, we did not measure uh, this time over here. I mean, it would be easy if we had delta T0 half, but we cannot measure this directly uh, because we drop our ball without making a noise. Um, also, we did not have a first bounce over here, so we do not have this time. What we do, do, do we do instead? Um, we look at the energy of the ball. So we can calculate the, uh, or we can express the potential energy at each of these maximum points. So that's just the potential energy uh, for this height one. Uh, simply the mass of our ball times Earth's acceleration times the height at which it is. So the higher an object is, or so imagine that you start to move your object from, from the floor. Um, the higher you have to move it, the more energy you have to, you have to put into this. Um, the higher the mass of the object, so the M, the more energy you have, you have to put into this. You need more energy to lift a heavier object. Okay? Um, and uh, the higher the acceleration is, um, the more energy you need to put in this. So the comparison would be, for example, on the moon, you don't need that much energy to lift a heavy object uh, because it has a smaller gravity and hence um, a lower um, acceleration. Okay, so um, with this, we get a potential energy for this height, a potential energy for the second height, a potential energy for the third height. What we do not get is a potential energy for height zero. Um, because for all the other ones, we know our variables. Uh, we could know the mass. Fox does know the mass, you did not enter the mass, but you will later see we, don't, we will not need it in the end, but in theory, we could weigh our ball and uh, tell its mass. We know the acceleration as long as you're doing this on Earth, which I assume here, and um, we know the height from our timing. Uh, but for H0, we still do not know the stuff. Um, we still know, we already know mass, we know the acceleration, but actually um, H0 is the information that we want to get. So we use this the other way around. If we figure out what the potential energy over here is, we can figure out H0. How do we do this? we look at the energy that is lost on each bounce. The energy is not actually lost, uh, it's converted to heat usually by deforming the ground, slightly deforming the ball, depends on your materials, but that's where, it, where energy is lost, it's just converted to a different form of energy. But if we only look at the kinetic energy or the potential energy of the ball, uh, we have less energy after each bounce. So we have um, a ball incoming over here um, it bounces and comes back and there's a certain ratio of energy, okay? So um, at this point, uh, after this bounce, it only has the ratio of uh, H2 over H1 left as its energy. And we can also look over here. So here we have H3 over H2 as the percentage of energy that's uh, left after the bounce. Um, and if we look at the bounces of our balls, for many balls, this number is usually very similar. So we can simply say, okay, maybe um, the ratio of the energies, uh, actually I was talking about the energies here. Um, so I took already away some of the information that's later there. So let's call it E3 over E2, E2 over E1. Uh, and over here we would have E1 over E0. And if it's actually the same for each bounce, we can say, okay, um, we now take the inverse for this because it's easier to calculate. E0 over E1 equals 
E1 over E2. So what we're saying here is the ratio of the energy before the bounce to the ratio after the bounce is the same for each bounce. Okay? Uh, we will later discuss if this is true, okay? <laughs> but uh, that's the assumption we need here. Um, and this actually is a very simple expression then, because for our energy we, say, we can say it's m times g times h0 over m g h1 equals, so this is this part of the formula, right? And m g h1 over m g h2 is the second part of the formula. And we've got the mass and the Earth's acceleration um, pretty much in every part, so we can um, yeah, uh, remove them from, from our ratio. So we only have h0 over h1 equals h1 over h2. And this means uh, if we simply multiply by h1, h0 is just h1 squared over h2. And h1 and h2 can simply be calculated from the time intervals using this formula we had at the beginning. And that's what TFOX does to calculate h0. Now the question is, is this valid? Um, the answer is this depends on the ball. Um, if you closely looked at my video where, you, where I uh, challenged you with this experiment, I um, did not really get that good results. Um, unfortunately, in the English version, uh, you could not see, uh, I did not show the tab with the energies. Um, I did this in the German version, so uh, don't get confused. Uh, this now has German labels because that was from the German uh, video. Um, but what you see here is I dropped the ball from a height of 50 centimeters and I got a result of only 45 centimeters. And that's a typical thing for this method. Uh, FeeFox usually gives you a little bit too small number. And the reason is uh, if you look at the percentages of the energy that's retained after bounce, so the small numbers, uh, the, the smaller numbers in, in, uh, in this uh, screenshot, um, you see that the first bounce um, or the first between, uh, the, the, actually it's from the second bounce, so it's the ratio of H1 to H2 is 46%, uh, while um, for the latest bounce that we recorded, it's 59%. So there's a huge difference in there uh, that the smaller bounces actually retain more energy. And um, the, this can be seen for many balls uh, or for many combinations of balls and uh, bouncing surfaces. Um, so the faster the ball impacts on the surface, the more uh, energy it loses even as a ratio, okay? Um, so this means uh, FeeFox assumes uh, that for this first bounce, uh, there is a higher part of the energy that was kept from the initial bounce. So it assumes that the um, original energy did not have to be so high to have enough energy left for, to reach H, uh, the, the height H1. Um, that's why in many cases we get a smaller number. But this really depends on the combination of the ball and the surface uh, because if you've got a good combination which uh, reliably bounces uh, with the same um, percentage of energy lost, uh, then you get a very good estimate. So with this uh, we can look at uh, one of the submissions we got via YouTube and also via Facebook, uh, the same one from our user uh, Antibottom. Um, yeah, let's have a look at, at uh, his video. Very nice video, well done. Um, what you saw there is uh, that uh, he actually reached uh, retained energy of almost 90% cons uh, consistently throughout all the bounces. Um, that's because of the hard stone surface uh, in combination with this marble he used. Um, uh, stone surfaces are really good, uh, they do not absorb any energy at all, that's why it's a bad thing to fall <laughs> onto, uh, um, uh, onto a stone surface. Uh, if you trip or something like this. Um, in this case, this is a good thing uh, because this way he achieved this really 90% uh, uh, retained energy thing and it's consistent throughout all his bounces, which is why he's got such a precise result. So let's have a look at another video from another user who sent in his video via Twitter, um, who has also quite a nice result.
So what you see here is that he consistently has values around uh, 66 and 70%. Uh, uh, if you calculate the heights, it doesn't show the uh, energies directly, but you can calculate the ratios. Um, so we do not have a reference here, um, but I think that the estimate from FreeFox would be also quite well, because uh, this percentage of energy um, is there quite consistently. Um, he also sent in another video outdoors, which I wanted to show you as well, because with this we can discuss something else. Uh, let's have a look. So here we only have three bounces. Um, uh, which is fine, it's just enough to calculate H0. The interesting thing now is the question, what is H0 here? Because what he did not do is uh, hold it up to H0 and then drop it, but instead he threw the ball up upwards. So what he did um, is this. Um, let's assume our user was standing here. Um, well, standing here is a relative term, this is time axis, but yeah. Uh, at some point in time, he takes the ball and throws it up, and then it's makes his parabola flight um, to reach H0 and then to drop again. And with this I already uh, told, the <laughs> told you the answer uh, of the question. Uh, our H0 is still the highest point on this curve because we calculated the energy of uh, this throw of the, the ball that uh, the energy the ball has just before its first impact and this corresponds to the potential energy of the highest point uh, on this curve. So it doesn't depend, uh, matter if he actually drops the ball or if he throws it upwards, it's the highest point on the curve. It's not the point, uh, not the height it has when you start throwing the ball somewhere. Uh, we cannot get this one, yeah, but what we always can get is the highest point. Uh, actually, uh, we, this can even be a virtual point if he was uh, uh, doing something different, uh, like standing over here. Uh, I want his arm to go over here uh, and actually drop the ball down instead of throwing it up, um, then the ball will never reach H0, but H0 would still be the height that corresponds to, um, to the energy that was put into the ball. You could also say uh, the ball could drop from H0 and when, he, uh, when the ball is at the uh, height from which uh, the user uh, pushes it down, um, it would have reached the same velocity. So H0 is the height it needs to reach the same velocity at the point at which the user would push it down. Uh, yeah, but that's now very detailed. So uh, just the thing is that uh, H0 can also be used to estimate how high you can throw a ball. Um, although of course then you don't have a reference to get an estimate on how well the uh, estimate from FeeFox is uh, because it's really hard to measure, uh, directly measure the height to which you throw the ball. Okay, so this was already a little bit more math than I anticipated for the first challenge. Uh, I hope you still enjoyed this. It's sometimes hard to follow someone explaining it like this when you're not doing it yourself on the paper. I think the next challenge will be posted tomorrow. Um, I hope to see you there again and uh, to see some nice contributions. Um, stay healthy. See you then.